Hello, everyone. I don't know if you got the notice that I'm doing this an hour later than I typically do. Um, my boys actually had Irish step competitions today. Hi, I'm in. Is that how you pronounce your name? I don't know. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you join us. My stream health is very poor. Unsupported resolution. I have no idea what that means. Um, well, I know what that means, but I don't know what that means. Uh, before we get started with other questions, before I forget about this, Matt, who is a regular on this live stream, said he's not able to make it today, but he messaged me on Facebook with his question. So, um, sorry, I'm like out of breath, like trying to put the dog away and stuff. Okay. So Matt messaged me with this question about um, when you're looking at like soprano, alto, tenor, and bass um, compositions, and why it is that the bass line very often goes up into the baritone range. Um, that is really a matter of practicality in some ways because the, the bass voice type, not the voice part, but the voice type is actually pretty rare. Um, there is not a plethora of basses, true bass voices. So typically the singers who are singing the bass part in a choir, in a chorus, are actually baritones. They're baritones who have uh, more of a lower extension, they may be lower baritones, and there may be some true basses in there as well. But um, that's, a, that's mostly why I think that's the case, is to be able to give those, um, the bass part, some movement with the voice so it's not always kind of just stuck down there within a small range of pitches. Um, I don't know if you guys listen to pentatonics at all. I think you do. Hi Cockney, how are you? And Angelina, hi, nice to see you. Um, I'm like out of breath, I don't know why, I'm just like trying to get the smile. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Okay, so yeah, if you guys follow pentatonics at all, it's really interesting because um, I'm, I just recorded um, went used my studio mic and such and I just recorded my acapella students and um, nine of us recorded our parts and such and it's really kind of interesting because if you look at um, whoever singing bass at the time depending on if it's Avi or um, singers after him um, he I mean he's got a great range to begin with but you can see that there are these really low bassy parts that are below the the bass staff even and then they go up into the treble staff at some point. Um, and there's this huge range that's expected of the bass voice. And um, I think that's pretty typical. And you will see, especially with something like pentatonics, where that bass is also occasionally singing part of the lead line. So and I hope that, hope that answers your question, Matt. Um, I can't talk to the either, apparently. So yeah, that's usually what's happening there is that you're not dealing with an actual voice classification, you're just dealing with a part in, like a voice part in the choir. And so that section of the choir is more typically baritone. And so those baritones will go up in there. So that's why your, you know, your basses will sometimes sound like baritones. Oh, you hooey, hi! Watching from work again. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not gonna get fired. <laughs> so, um, dark. Zero five bones, is it zero? It looks like a zero. That's a very interesting name. Um, hello, I'm new. Oh, hi, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you're a tenor, that's good to know. Uh, Corbin, I think your name's new too. Hi, I'm not sure what the case is, but after I sing hi for a while, I notice an issue. I'm a tenor and it's difficult to endure the high register when singing loud. Um, yeah, I don't know what that would be exactly. So you're singing your tenor and you're singing high for a while. What do you mean um, with endure the high register? Like, does your voice start to kind of um, start to lose strength in general? Or is it just, is it, um, does it feel weak? Does it feel like it's fatiguing? Um, does it fatigue very readily? Or is it just after you've been singing for quite some time, which was, is somewhat normal? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in getting a little bit more information from you about that because it could it could be several things. But uh, one thing I will say this is that tenors very often do like to kind of sit up in that tenor range, tenor tessitura. But just like with any other voice part, if you're really practicing in the high range, 
even if you are a high voiced singer, you always want to make sure that you're also practicing down in the low range. So you're making sure that after you've exercised your upper range or your lower range, then you switch so that you're using like a different set of muscles and you're keeping the voice very supple and you're making sure that you're not developing your upper range to the detriment of your lower range or, or to the neglect of your lower range. So um, always make sure that you're practicing voice both and that will help. Um, but I don't really know, I don't have all the information so it's hard for me to say exactly. Cockney. So what would the alto section be? So all, the alto section is typically made up of mezzo-sopranos like myself. <laughs> um, if I were a high mezzo-soprano, I might be like a soprano two, or a low soprano might be soprano two, but altos are really just your middle of the road voices. Um, contraltos are also just like basses, they're very rare voice types, so you may see the occasional true contralto in an alto section, but it's usually just like we mezzos. Um, see, I'm going to also have a hard time harmonizing. Yeah, that's um, that's a that's a skill when you when you're working. Um, I don't know if you you have a lot of choral experience, um, Alejandra. Um, if you do, if you don't, um, it'd be a really great experience for you to go find some community choir where it's maybe a non-audition choir, and start to learn to be able to um hear your voice in relation to other voices and then it would really be helpful if you had other voices singing your part. I feel like that's the, I know for me with learning harmony I always felt like, because um, it's not my strength and I teach acapella singing but it's really, it's like, it's it was a steep learning curve for me to learn harmony because I just didn't grow up singing it. I grew up singing lead and um, it took a, an incredible amount of prayer and, <laughs> and effort <laughs> trying to learn how to sing harmony and um, what I found was when I was by myself like on the worship team for example if I wasn't leading when I was by myself I found it very very difficult sometimes to find my part especially if my voice didn't really blend well with the worship leader and but what I found was when I started teaching acapella singing and I started singing the different voice parts it was so much easier when you had other people supporting you and singing that part and then you learn to be able to just kind of hear how your voice blends and you hear those nice harmonic relationships with the other voices. But sometimes when you're stuck out there, if it's not your strength, if you struggle a lot with it, that's hard. So I would encourage you to do a lot of like listening to a cappella music, listen to your pentatonics and your, um, you know, just, I don't know what kind of music you listen to, but there's so much a cappella music out there. Like, um, you know, collegiate a cappella um, is really huge right now. but. I would really encourage you to use that and then also um, listen to like a lot of the 50s and 60s music for example because there's lots of harmony in, in that music from then and also um, you know you're like um, some of your like barbershop quartets and things like that. The more I think you listen to it and the more you start straying away from the lead melody which is what I've had to force myself to do is I've, st I've had to kind of make it make a, an, an active um, like actively listen for the harmony parts and sing them as opposed to sort of making it easier on myself by singing lead because um, it's so much easier <laughs> but um, learning to be able to like when I when I go into church on Sunday mornings if I'm not up with the congregation I am uh, if I'm in the congregation I'm not up on stage I am singing harmony and I'm listening to what the backup singer is doing and um, we usually have more than one and you know, so I'm trying to actively sing what they're singing and learning to be able to train my ear to hear music differently. I think it's really a matter of training your ear because I don't think our ears always go in that direction. I know some singers would, would, would say that theirs do, like they just have always gravitated toward it, but if you're struggling, it means that you probably need more exposure to it, more practice. Excuse me, but the community choir idea is fantastic because again, you're going to be learning to hear your voice in relation to other notes, but also you're going to have the support of other people around you who are singing the same part. Oh, I'm falling behind, I know. Um, let's see. Um, mezzos, yeah. Yeah, it would be it would be mezzos, Cockney. Um, Corbin, I don't, don't know what the yes was to. Mario, hi, I think I'm a bass. Matt would love to chat with you. <laughs> we have Matt who is not here today, but is a regular and he um, he's exploring his bass voice right now. Diana, I'm a classical soprano prepping queen of the night. Ooh, 
for our production next semester. I'm working very hard on a poji on breathing exercises to make it through the runs without taking a breath. Uh, I don't know if you ran out of space, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I think when you're singing classical music, you, you really need to rely on that, you know, that method of breath management because um, it's really going to help you pace that outgoing breath, ma maintaining that, um, you know, elevation of the sternum, maintaining the lower rib expansion for at least a good part of the vocal phrase will help you mitigate pressures, help you pace that outgoing breath, slow the rise of the diaphragm, and that's really what you need there. And making sure that it's really an efficient breath. Sometimes I think we can go through the actions of having the good alignment, and we can look like we're expanding and getting a breath, but especially if the breath gets up really high, it can be kind of a shallow breath, which is fine when you have short vocal phrases, and you know, as in a lot of contemporary music that we sing, um, but in classical music, you really need that nice low breath. The breath should also be a quiet breath because if it's not quiet, that means that there's some sort of obstructions of, of the airflow somewhere along the way, which means you're probably not getting a really good, efficient inhale as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to say Michael, even though I'm probably wrong, so I apologize. <laughs> I started to use Mind Palace to remember things. Can it be used to remember lyrics also? Um, unfortunately, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, I imagine that any any tool that you use to try to improve your memory, any strategies that you might use, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't apply it to the song lyrics. So, um, yeah, we all find like you know our our little tricks, I think, to help us remember song lyrics. So, try it, see if it works. Stop me. My choir leader wants me to come away from my choir soprano section and sing as an alto. She reckon singing tenor be pushing too low. Yeah, so the thing with the alto, because again, it's sung by mezzo-sopranos. Very oftentimes, the alto sections go up into the fifth octave. It's not like it's a low, we're not talking low voices, because much of the upper third and lower fourth um, octave octaves are occupied by the tenor, the tenor part. So we don't want altos encroaching too much on the tenor part because that just wouldn't really make for a very beautiful harmony and it would just would be kind of messy. So generally speaking you will see the the mezzos, the, the the altos tend to be up in the upper fourth, lower fifth is where they spend a lot of their time. They will go lower, depends on what it is. Like again, we're doing the first Noel from Pentatonics and you know I've got a couple, you know, notes in the third octave and I think my highest note I think it's only a C5 on that, and I'm singing the soprano part, which isn't really soprano. <laughs> um, so, you know, it depends on the, the composition, it depends on the piece. Um, you'll find that a lot of, like, more contemporary music that's like, contemporary choral music tends not to go venture quite as high, even though for the sopranos, as more classical choral music. That's not um, a, a, fa a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, that's what I've observed is that. Um, more um, classical style, you t they tend to like let the soprano soar a little bit more, and then as a result, the altos will tend to be up a little bit higher. But honestly, generally speaking, I don't think the the alto part is extremely low. And I think I, I know a little. I've, I've heard your voice a little bit Cockney, so I think it's something you could probably manage. And yeah, that depends on the tenor part. I mean, are we talking high tenor? Are we talking, you know, how low does the tenor part go? I think it really depends on the composition of the song itself because it really does differ from song to song and you may find that you move to the alto part and one song sits perfectly in a range another song is either too high or too low um, so yeah just I don't know play it by ear I don't know if you're allowed to switch parts or not I know some choirs um, actually will let people kind of move in and out of different sections if they can't if they can't manage a note uh, let's see design let's do it <laughs> startista I'm a soprano but I kind of get shouty and strain in my upper register my chest voice tone color is very warm and nice but once I enter my mix head voice my tone gets very unpleasant how do I fix it um it, it's so hard in this kind of thing because I don't really I haven't heard your voice I don't know what's going on usually what happens is when we get up to the upper range our voices become unpleasant for a few reasons one we just don't work it enough we don't spend enough time up there really developing it 
and hone, honing that, um, honing the skills up there. Um, the other thing is oftentimes, what more often than not, is that we start to squeeze and get tight up there. And we tend to get kind of an overly bright, possibly shrill voice. Um, and you're saying that it, it tends to, what did you say, it's kind of shouty and strained. Yeah, so um, I suspect that you're really probably not transitioning really into like what I would call like a full head voice up there. You're probably kind of fighting it. And I don't know exactly where you're talking about in the upper register, if you're talking like, you know, lower fifth or upper fifth and sixth octaves. But um, typically that's, that's what I hear. Um, and if you're feeling like the sense of strain, again, it, you know, you've got to look at your breath. You have to look at, um, you know, what your throat is doing. And it, it, I don't know what you're singing. I don't really have an idea if you're singing choral classical music, if you're singing um, pop music. It'd be kind of good to know because um, I think how we approach it is somewhat differently. But generally speaking, as you go higher in the range, you have to add, if you're singing classical music, you want to add um, some warmth to the sound or maintain warmth as opposed to losing it. I think that's a better way of saying it. Isn't You're not adding space that didn't already exist below it. Um, but I feel like generally speaking, just going into that inhale posture and kind of letting that be your default setting up there I think is really helpful as you get higher and higher in the skill your larynx will start to rise for women in you know oftentimes around a5 is where we start to notice that the larynx kind of needs to rise and we also get into that kind of whoop timbre up there that we just need to figure out how to make it not sound so choir boyish um, but if you're saying it's strained and shouty, then I suspect that you're probably like dragging up too much weight and you're not um, really surrendering to that full head voice. So in that case, what I would do is I would do a lot of work on your E's and O's because um, those are great head voice vowels. And um, we've done that exercise before. V, 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 V. And then you're doing five, four, three, two, one. Um, it's a sustained V sound. And when you do that, it's a semi occlusion, it's a semi occluded sound. And so you're getting this really nice positive back pressure that really sets up the vocal folds to squares them up nicely, helps them vibrate really, really efficiently. And then it's also really hard to strain and squeeze through that. Like I feel that sense of back pressure also. When I do those exercises, when I'm more warmed up, <clears throat> and I'm not dealing with the allergies, by the way, um, <laughs> what I feel is as soon as I start to do, <clears throat> right here, I start engaging, and it's automatic, and I, f I feel like that helps us to make that connection when you're doing those semi-occlusions, and you're, that everything just starts to fall into place. Um, of course, sometimes there's some tweaking that you still have to do beyond that. But I would try that exercise, and you can always try, you know, straw phonation through there, um, especially as a warm up. You can you can do your sirens and things like that, and just see if that helps to kind of release things inside the throat. That's what it should do, um, and I feel like it works effectively for most singers, not all, but most. Um, but try the V and see what happens as you move through. And you'll probably find that as you get higher. You have to kind of soften that closure a little bit so you're not, you know, really, really hard with the closure. A lot of singers kind of start to release that a little bit. Um, and that will help your voice kind of turn over into this head voice more effectively. Then you've got the E vowel and the descending pattern. I think it's really, really helpful. It's going to hopefully eliminate some of the strain. All right, let's see. Corbin, singing high at first is comfortable for me. Oh, it was, it, you were answering, or filling in more information, right? <laughs> Singing high at first is comfortable for me, but I think straining your tension creeps in and I can't endure. Okay. Yeah, so I suspect that, see, it's possible. Oh, so many things could be <laughs> explaining that. So oftentimes when we're singing in a really high range for a while is we will start to fatigue and then our instruments will start to try to compensate. And then we start becoming kind of almost hyperfunctional and start really using our muscles a lot more. Um, so it could be that that your your body's saying, "Okay, I need you to head back down for a little while." 
and you're you're resisting that and you're saying no 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 I'm gonna push through this push through this and you have to keep working harder and harder and harder to try to stay up there and I think that's when um, before you get to that point I mean I don't know how you're singing in the upper range so that is really also something that you have to look at is how you're singing um, that's leading you to feeling this way um, but yeah so you're saying at first it's comfortable yeah I think that you might be overdoing it I think that you might be singing too long and so in that case what you could do is you could break up your practice sessions and try to get instead of one a day try to do two in a day and spend you know a half or maybe only two-thirds as much time singing in the upper range as you ordinarily do and then make sure again that you're spending time in the lower range so that you're balancing everything out um, and if you spend a lot of time up there go down exercise your chest voice muscles um, and that kind of just helps to it's like a cool down a little bit and you're using a different set of muscles and that allows the other muscles to kind of recuperate so I would give that a try and you could always do you know it's not the cure-all but you could always do um, semi occluded exercises you can do your gentle humming and you could do your straw formation and things like that um, lip rolls tongue drills brrr, those kinds of exercises um, that kind of help to they don't use a lot of vocal weight and they can kind of really ease you into um, things and, and be a good cool down as well but spend some time in the lower range cut that practice time a little bit um, split it up into two so you're not fatiguing and then again if you're fatiguing and then you're trying to you know you're developing these compensatory strategies for trying to keep going then that's going to be reinforcing bad things that you don't want to be reinforcing so hopefully that helps <clears throat> sorry guys my allergies are yucky still I've been off of all allergy medications for a while now and I've noticed virtually no difference except that things aren't as thick <laughs> TMI sorry all right Diana <sighs> and while my whole voice is improving I'm still having a hard time singing low phrases do I just need to stick with it or is there anything else I should do I don't know if you wrote something, Diana, Diana, I'm going to go back up and see. Oh, classical soprano, but the breath. Um, if you are a soprano, it doesn't mean you can't sing low, I will say that. However, it's not going to be your sweet spot per se, down in the lower range. It's not going to be the, your home. It's a place to visit, and then you kind of go back up to where you want to be. Um, Sopranos very often have difficulty singing in the low range. They have difficulties accessing chest voice sometimes depending on their training and depending on kind of their own mental concept of what they should sound like when they're singing. And so um, some of it is just kind of getting past the psychological. Um, some of it is just embracing the physiological and the anatomical aspects of your, your natural voice. And some of it is technique. Um, like I love doing like you know if you're if you're struggling in the low range I love adding twang that really just making sure that you have a really bright twangy sound um, you could do like ma 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 and keeping it like that ma in that bright space um, I feel like that's really helpful because oftentimes we want to reach low with the larynx and we want to go oh, and sing like that and that actually can make it really uncomfortable um, and it doesn't, to me, if I, if I try to push as well, um, I'm not a soprano or a mezzo, but um, I find like when I go into the lower range, if I try to really get loud and push for volume, I tend to not feel so great. And so what I do instead is I, I add twang and it cleans things up and it helps the voice carry and I'm working smarter, not harder. And so that's one thing that you may find too. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're pushing, I don't know if you're reaching down low with the larynx and, and trying to do that, but um, descending patterns are also helpful. Just, you know, sliding down instead of trying to, you know, start low, because if you start, if you try to start low, it, you just may not be setting yourself up, you're setting your instrument up perfectly and coordinating it, so sometimes when you start at a slightly higher pitch, maybe sliding down a fifth, um, you, you'll carry that really good coordination down with you. And then again, just make sure that it's kind of staying, you know, in that I would say twangier space. I don't, know, I don't know if again if you're singing classical music or not, as opposed to kind of really digging and going ugh with everything. It'll sound better too, and the voice will be clearer. Ah, uh, okay. 
Um, hopefully that helps. Um, Dark zero five moves. I have a problem switching from chess to mix. Um, have some breaks near f4. Okay. I'm assuming you're male then. Um, not that females can't break there either, but um, but I can catch real high notes with light sound. Heady f5. Some help. I'm new with singing technique. All right. <laughs> it's so hard sometimes to like give you good direction because I really I'm. When I'm trying to figure out what's going on with the singer, I really need to do a lot of listening and observation. Um, so I'm just kind of going on the limited information that you're giving me here. But let's see. I'm switching from breaks. Okay, so um, yeah, I closed voice. <laughs> I'm wondering. I, I don't know what you're what you sing if it's if it's you know classical or non-classical style, but um, I wonder what you're doing leading up to that F4. Usually when there is a break and somebody notices that kind of real dramatic flip or switch into the higher register, they're bringing up a lot of chest voice weight up until that point. So what I find is really effective, and there's so many different things, like just um, I love, actually I have a video that's supposed to be coming out this week, this week. Um, <laughs> just using the NG for vocal registration, kind of making it a little bit more seamless. The allowing allowing some of the, the resonance to filter through the nose is actually has can have a really good interaction. That nasal resonance can have a good interaction with vocal fold uh, vibration through the passaggio in particular, that little passage between the two registers. And so um, if you're doing something like an NG, sliding through that and making sure it's kind of this mm, mm, and it's not mm, and your tongue's not going Ooh, and you're not gagging on the NG so it's like sing sing keep it really bright and let it kind of move into that heady space don't fight it oftentimes what happens is singers would go mm, and they start to uh, throttle the tone and pull back but if you just let it go into that going into that bright space, um, even if it's not how you ultimately want to sing with that much brightness, that ring can be really, really helpful to cueing your instrument to come just adjust. And again, that nice interaction with the resonance and the vocal fold vibration can be really beneficial. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to address there, too. Uh, oh, yeah, so the notes leading up to that F4 is usually where the problems start. Um, I don't know if you're getting, if you notice it at all, that you're probably getting louder and louder and louder and louder as you move through C, C sharp, D, D sharp. Um, and if that's the case, you can kind of learn to be able to consciously level out that volume, let out, level out the loudness. And if you do that, what you may find is that you may switch a little bit earlier initially. You don't have to necessarily in the end, but you may find that you're not pushing that change like you're not pushing that that transition higher and higher and higher um, and then you may find that it helps you to level out the um, your I guess the loudness but also the instrument just has a better chance of adjusting because you're not being so chest voice dominant through those notes you're allowing that transition to happen progressively and um, in a graduated way hopefully that helps and also um, learning to be able to acoustically close off the voice because I don't know what you're doing but it sounds like you're going into um, F, F4 F it sounds like you're moving or, or heady F5 so are you saying that like you can get into that heady space at F5 and you're saying that the F4 breaks does it immediately go into that heady space is it more of like a whoop woo -hoo, woo -hoo, that lighter kind of coordination where it's really um, bell-like and focused, but it's not very big. I mean, bad example. <laughs> or eventually I'll figure out. All right. Um, anyway, yeah, so learning to be able to acoustically close off the voice, which is more than I think I can really um, talk about right here, and I think I completely lost um, my voice. Oh, do, 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 do. Sorry, guys. Um, 
Yeah, and learning to be able to not fight that that turning over of the vowel into that head voice resonance um, is also helpful. And a lot of that starts to happen around that that pitch range um, for guys. Um, I'm in, hi, remember me? I remember your name. I do, I don't know if there's a specific question or something I answered to this before, but um, I do remember your name. Talk me, I'm the exact opposite, Karen. Oh, if I didn't hard to sing the main melody of a song, well, I think for you, because your voice is higher, Cockney, I think that the, some of that is just a practical thing that you probably always gravitated toward a higher harmony um, just because the melody was always just sitting in a bad spot in your range. So I think you've kind of been forced almost to kind of become that person who knows harmony and can find it. Um, I, on the other hand, always found that it just kind of sat well with my medium voice. <laughs> So, um, my professor tells me to be patient, but I am very advanced. I feel resonance in the chest and head registry after five months. Uh, so, sorry, seven months. I don't know why you even said five. I think I was looking somewhere else. Sorry. I can't read. All right. Um, that's good. I mean, you're working with somebody, so just stick with it and just trust the process because it does take time. And um, even if you're moving along really quickly, which is great, um, you know, just keep um, keep plugging away at it. Stay encouraged. Um, there will be times. I mean, being realistic, there will be times when you feel like you're kind of your progress sort of stalls a little bit, and then it picks back up and it kind of sits there for a little while, and your voice kind of settles into things. Um, but yeah, if you're working with somebody, um, I would just say just stick with it. Um, follow the advice, assuming that this teacher is a good teacher, and um, you'll 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 reach your goals. Keep working at it. Fuck me, I'll pretty much always gravi gravitate toward harmony. Yeah. Um, Alejandro, you're welcome. James, hi James, nice to see you. Uh, Corbin, I try to sing F sharp for forte, but since I can't endure a switch to falsetto and can't be heard. Yeah, so that I would say, that to me sounds like you're probably trying to sing completely open voiced. Um, and when I when I refer to open and closed voice, I would um, I would suggest you go check out my video at an interview with Professor Ken Bozeman. I would check out that video, and I have another video I think on um, vowel mo modification, um, and I talk about passive and active vowel modification, and I talk a little bit about what it means to for the voice to turn over. But when I'm talking about that, I'm really talking about the relationship between the resonance frequency of the vocal tract. So the first resonance in particular, the I know formants and resonance aren't always exactly the same thing, but we'll say the first formant, which is just the lowest resonance frequency of your vocal tract, just to make it easy, um, and the second harmonic of the sung pitch. So when we're producing a pitch with our vocal fold vibration, it's a complex tone. It's made up of, of multiple harmonics, multiple pitches, and the, the harmonic that's exactly one octave above the fundamental frequency, the pitch is called your second harmonic. So we have this formant frequency in the vocal tract, which is just, again, um, you know, everything, I don't know if I won't get it there, but everything has its own resonance frequency if it's got a resonator. And so as we're singing, here's the pitch we're singing, here's the, the, the second harmonic. As we're singing, we have two choices as we move through, well, essentially two choices as we move up the scale. We can we can let the pitch rise and let the harmonic rise and then we can kind of um, these we can kind of lock these guys together and we can as pitch rises we can keep moving that formant higher and higher and higher and we do that by shortening the vocal tract and narrowing it and you know lowering the jaw and doing all sorts of wonderful things um, and then um, the other the other option of course is to just kind of let like stabilize this formant by keeping everything the same um, relatively stable in here, larynx roughly the same position, not really making radical changes elsewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me, so you stabilize that and then as pitch rises that second harmonic starts to rise above and that's what we call the turning over of the vowel where the, there, it's really all about this relationship between the first formant and the second harmonic. Um, it's probably more than you need to really know but when that happens is we, we get um, if we allow that to happen and if we have other things in place like having the breath management um, in particular having a well-supported tone we will get a very very full sound 
that isn't loud and shouty and you will make that transition into head voice a lot more seamlessly and it will be head voice and not like a really weak falsetto and that's something that you really need to work on. Um, I do an exercise with um, some of my students, a Burton Coffin exercise, it's just like a one, two, three, four, three, two, one. And, um, sorry, my nose is itchy. And um, when you're doing that, you're basically, you're switching vowels and it's it's more than I can get into here. Um, it's, it's something you kind of really need to work through, I think, with a singing teacher, to be honest. But um, not letting the voice get to that point where it's yelling and shouting I think is really important or getting that where it's getting louder and louder and louder and louder until it finally breaks I think is really critical I would say just kind of leveling out that loudness what will will generally happen and trying to make sure that it's not getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter as well when you do that what generally happens is you're actually you start to um, stabilize the vocal tract its shape and size and then the turning over actually will just kind of happen automatically. It's when you try to hold on to very speech-like vowels, when you try to hold on to chest voice, that's when we tend to get those really dramatic breaks and when, when we, we don't get that turning over of the vowel. So then we start to get that really open voice singing where we're kind of shouting, you know, so. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's very complex and I'm not trying to make it more complicated than it needs to be, but. Yep, ran out of space. Oh, okay. Uh, Cockney sounds like you're trying to take your test register to go. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's probably what's going on. And it's kind of an educated guess too, based on what you said, but also the fact that so many singers do it. Um, it's just really common. It's just really common. <laughs> so Chris, oh hi Chris, nice to see you. Okay, I made it. Question: I am always run out of breath in the middle of a sentence when singing. My breath control is bad eight to nine seconds and I'm out of air. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are a few things that can make breath control ineffective. First of all, not getting an efficient enough breath to begin with, and I talked about that earlier. Um, I think you might not have been here yet, but making sure that, I mean, I think it's a good practice, even if you're not singing classical music where the phrases are very long and you need a lot more breath, I think it's still a good practice to learn to start with really good alignment, getting that nice tallness in the body like you're kind of um, lifting away from the floor as opposed to sort of feeling really heavy and sinking into that feeling of buoyancy, but also stability. And getting the sternum elevated so it's not just kind of like sunken in here, making sure that your shoulders are nice and aligned and you know, you're feeling that sense of tallness like you're I always get the feeling the skull kind of lifting away from the shoulders is really helpful and getting that sternum elevated and then when you're taking in the breath you need to do it with that feeling of um I always say like inspiration so it should be this really open feeling inside the throat and it should be a really quiet and fast breath and that breath should feel like it's coming down here of course, the lungs are not down there in the lower ribs, but you want this feeling of the air just kind of coming in very unobstructed and these lower ribs expanding. And that's the first thing you need to do is get that alignment and get that really efficient inhale. If you're breathing up really high, and again, that may serve you in certain styles and certain techniques, but generally speaking, if you are having difficulties with your breath control, it could be that, that you're breathing up too high, which is actually a shallow breath. It's not as deep a breath, so start with that. And then you have to look at your glottal resistance efforts, like how are your vocal folds closing? Are you getting enough compression in the sound or are you leaking air? Are you, is it airy? Um, you know, how, how are you managing your breath after that? Are you pushing or are you trying to resist that a little bit? Um, what part of the range are you singing in? Because I think that can affect our breath a little bit. So I, you have to really look at a lot of different things to know why. Um, I have, if you look at the Farinelli exercise, I do have a video on that topic which may be helpful. And it just, it really trains you to learn to be able to pace the outgoing breath, slow things down to like slow the rise of the diaphragm to resist that desire of the ribs to collapse and the sternum to collapse 
um, that may be effective. So I have a video on Farinelli, F-A-R-I-N-E-L-L-I, -L -L -I, and uh, that might be helpful. We're singing the first Noel as well. <laughs> Is it, um, are you doing the pentatonics arrangement of it, Cockney? Good choirs think alike, yeah. Well, it's actually, um, my students picked that song last year. Well, we, we were torn between two songs and we went with another pentatonic song last year. And um, so this year I, like, I recycled the request. And so we're doing that this year. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, hi, Janet. I don't know if you've been here all along or not, but Janet is our wonderful moderator for the live stream. So nice to have you, Janet. Yeah, Queen of the Night's a, a good challenging piece for sure. Cockney, the tenors or are more like high baritones? Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> it's, choir is kind of hard because if you think about voices, it's like anything else. It's really kind of on a continuum. There's a whole spectrum of voices. So one soprano is not necessarily going to have the same range or the same tessitura as the next soprano. Same with the tenors, you know. You might have one tenor who's a little higher than the other, and another tenor is you know, a little lower and has a broader range, whatever it might be. It's just, you know, where there's such uniqueness and such, a, I don't know, spectrum, for lack of a better word, when it comes to voice types, that I think, I think you really just have to look at the general tessitura of, of each part. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, ten, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people in, in the tenor, singing tenor who are not necessarily, they're either not tenors and they're like higher baritones who just like to sing high or feel comfortable singing high, or they're poorly trained baritones, um, or sorry, poorly trained tenors who are struggling. And um, so I think sometimes that means that the tenor part gets a little bit lower in some, in some like contemporary music especially. You'll hear a lot of um, a lot of tenor parts that are a little bit lower because they're you know I know I think there's some tenor parts in, in music that I've done with my students that I think hasn't gone past like an E um, like an E four and even then the students have struggled a little bit with it because they're just not well trained and I work I'm, I, I work with adolescents too so their voices are just kind of they're new voices to them especially the guys and you know um, so they're struggling through some of that that change and adjusting to a different, you know, comfort zone for them. Um, uh, Chris, you're a true lyr uh, lyric light tenor. Oh, good. Urban cocky, yes, yeah, but I find that since I'm singing loud, I can't control it, and it always flips into falsetto instead. So yeah, straw work, stuff like that, where and the NG, something where you're learning to be able to manage that transition, and um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but also I suspect that you need to do a little bit of work on closed voice because I think um, learning to be able to close things off actually makes it easier for you to get that big full sound without shouting and without um, forcing and, and such. So he said, I'm most comfortable singing at like the top of my range, which is around C6. Okay, but there's an area around... G5, it's very hard for me to sing in. Why is that? Ah, oh, <laughs> the dreaded G5. <laughs> that is actually a problem note for many females. Um, I find that that's the point at which I think there's an acoustical thing going on um, that we're experiencing these acoustical shifts that happen. Um, and it doesn't even seem to be necessarily related, though, to the specific vowel that's being sung. And up there, the vowels start to merge and sound a little bit more like each other. Um, G5, not as much yet, but it's kind of inching its way that way. But I find that more often than not around G5, there's something about, I guess, the interaction of the vocal fold vibration with the resonance that causes the singer to want to throttle the tone. Um, I'll often hear things like diplophonia, which is like two tones at the same time. Um, you'll hear these different sounds. You'll hear like throttling and choking of the tone. And I think that's just a matter of learning to be able to make different adjustments to the vocal tract, learning to be able to, um, I don't know why I'm wheezing, but learning to be able to lower the jaw differently and even, even you know, sometimes letting the jaw fall, but then as you get higher, learning to be able to lift the skull away from the jaw, if that makes sense, um, giving the, the vowel its space and... Um, 
All right. Yeah, so there's so many reasons why that could be the case, but I find it's oftentimes just that things just are not quite shaped optimally for that particular pitch. So you have to fiddle around with things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Try different techniques try different vowel modifications even, not that I necessarily think that it's always the best thing to modify vowels, but maybe try singing more with an uh posture in the throat, even with the vowel here, and then over time what you can do is you can adjust the vowel so it sounds more like the original vowel, <laughs> um, but you could try ooh, like uhs and uhs and see how that works, like if you sing like a nice ooh, a nice ooh would be good. Sorry about that. Um, oh, Corbett, you're a classical singer. Okay, good to know. Janet, thank you. A few months. You'll share the recording. So that would be great. Are you singing on your break area star? Okay, I find the higher I sing, the less I crack. Yeah, because just generally speaking, you know, I know. I think I know you, Cockney. You suspect that you're probably more of like a counter tenor, right? And that makes sense. You know, there's that security up there for you. <clears throat> Maybe the F5 area is just very strained and shouty, but the top of my head voice is the most comfortable part of my range. Yeah, so I suspect that you, like a lot of people, are just kind of um, not making those anticipatory adjustments earlier. Um, I find that for most of us females, I think that I think you said just soprano, right? Um, I find that for most of us, even though the the difficult part is more like your E F F sharp that if we don't make those adjustments, starting at C, C sharp, D, somewhere around there, it's almost like, I won't say too late, but things are already a little bit so out of balance by the time we get to that E, F, F sharp, that um, we, we do tend to feel not so great and sound not so great. So I find for myself, even as a mezzo, a lyric mezzo, that E5 is my, my upper passaggio, where I definitely go into more of a head resonance, generally speaking. Um, if I'm like doing a high belt, it's definitely a different feeling. But I feel like if I don't start transitioning around C sharp, that my E is off kilter. So yeah, you may you may feel like you need to actually make that transition a little bit earlier, and not waiting until it gets it's to the point where it's it's so out of balance. See when her voice is fatigued, that's when we land up with nodes. Um, yes and no. I mean, it depends on what the fatigue is. Sometimes it's just the muscles are just overworking, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the vocal folds are going to be unhealthy. Um, but yeah, it could it, it could be again if you're working through, like I said earlier, and you're you're developing compensatory techniques to try to compensate for the fatigue, then that could very well lead to some sort of vocal injury. I'm in. I have tried lightening my voice and not stay in heavy coordination, but even if I was in my head voice, I still stuck in the heavy coordination. Have any tips uh, to not carry the weight higher? So in that case, I would actually go above your passaggio area, above your break, and I would start in falsetto or head voice, whatever you're able to manage, um, and I would do descending patterns, like a five, four, three, two, one kind of thing, going from your wherever that might be. For you, maybe it might be a C5, for example, going into that heady coordination and bringing that down. I also feel like um, like lip rolls, tongue trills, those kinds of exercises are, are really beneficial too because they kind of use a thinner edge function of the vocal folds. And so it's really hard to drag, drag a lot of weight up when you're doing or right? You can't really, you can't really overly weigh it down, I find. So I would do, if you're going to go in an ascending pattern, you know, I would do the sirens and I would do um, scales like that. And I feel like the hums, humming is nice sometimes, like a gentle hum. And anticipating that, that heavy, you know, the, the increasing heaviness and weight of the voice and not letting that happen ahead of time. Anticipating it ahead of time, not letting that happen ahead of time. <laughs> Uh, wow, I'm so distracted. Okay, um, so yeah, I would do like descending patterns because that will encourage you to get into that higher voice and then bring that down through your break area and bring, I would just bring head voice all the way down as low as you can, down into the third octave, which will sound really thin and it will sound really weak 
but I think it's actually a really good exercise in trying to help you find balance. Um, Cockney. Then we land at um, needing an operation. <laughs> well, hopefully you don't need any kind of surgery for for vocal nodes or anything. Um, those are actually it's very rare that somebody needs surgery for something like that um, anymore with just a little bit of voice therapy. Um, it's they usually resolve on their own if you're learning, you know, acquiring better voice use practices and 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 have some good guidance with some voice therapy or even a singing teacher. I've worked with some students and helped them with nodules and polyps and such. Um, just it's really just about learning good technique and also good vocal hygiene practices in general, even outside of singing, like not shouting at the bar <laughs> and uh, you know, or at the wedding or whatever it might be, and and you know, not letting yourself get dehydrated and things like that that really go a long way too because you really need that lubrication from the, the hydration, consistent hydration. I've never had any but I've been worried about them. Startista, if you are worried about your voice at, at, at all, just go see an ENT or a laryngologist. Um, laryngologists are more specialized but they may be a little harder to see, to get in to see. Um, you may have to wait much longer. I don't know what your insurance is like uh, or where you live but um, if you're concerned, when in doubt, just go see somebody who can scope you and can just kind of give you the thumbs up or thumbs down, but more often than not, it's the thumbs up. Um, and, you know, meet with a singing teacher. Singing teachers cannot diagnose officially, but singing teachers have really keen ears and we can hear when something doesn't sound right. Um, and it sounds like it's beyond technique. And that's when we make our referrals to ENTs or laryngologists. So um, if you have any concerns, just, I think, just for your own sake, <laughs> just for your own um, reassurance, I think it's a good idea to just rule out the possibility. So I'm most comfortable between F3 and about F5, yes, give or take. I know you guys are just chatting with each other a little bit. I think there's a vocal therapy to get rid of nodules instead of having surgery. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're thinking of like um, I'm in, in, I'm sorry. What is it? What is technique? Never heard that term. <laughs> I know you're joking because I know you a little bit, Dr. <laughs> um, ah, oh my gosh, this always happens. I try to scroll down and I end up getting like missing a thousand of these things. Hmm, let's see. Adam, hi! I don't know if you've been here before, but welcome. Um, how to make high notes and head voice sound more masculine by lowering larynx. Well, so... I'm always cautious about the lowering the larynx thing, especially if you sing in contemporary styles and if you're somebody with belts and such, because it's not... Um, the low larynx is really more conducive to classical styles, where you want to have that chiaroscuro timbre, where there's a warmth but also the ring in the voice um, but yeah I mean I don't know if you're a tanner and maybe you feel like your voice is not as deep as you'd like it to sound um, you can definitely lower the larynx but the problem with that is that it doesn't necessarily make the voice sound more masculine sometimes it can just sort of falsify the timbre and it kind of adds this sort of artificial darkness as opposed to the sound of something being more masculine, whatever that means. Um, I, mean, I think we all have different ideas of what masculine means, and I don't want to like say that there's like one standard, because there isn't, but um, I think that there's a risk of saying, okay, lower the larynx, right? Because again, it sometimes just sounds dark and dull. It doesn't actually sound more masculine, for lack of a better word. So, um, but that being said, if your larynx is creeping up really, really high, not just a little bit, like really high, you can get that really um, um, higher pitched kind of timbre, even if, you know, the same pitch, um, same frequency. Um, you can get that, it, it can sound as though you're singing higher than you are, or it can sound um, not, yeah, not as rich and warm. And so in that case, you know, sometimes learning to be able to do you know, get that nice inhale posture with your throat is great. Um, straw phonation is always, almost always beneficial for singers. So you could work 
through, you know, with singing into a straw and I have a video on this topic on straw phonation and um, doing your scales and sirens that way, singing through um, vocal melodies for your songs, um, putting it in a glass of water and I have instructions for, you know, you all, I think I, I may have missed that on the video, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, sticking it maybe about half an inch, three quarters of an inch into the water, not all the way down to the bottom. Um, but that little extra resistance kind of increases that back pressure. It's a positive back pressure that helps to open up the throat. And you may find that that is a better way of learning to posture your vocal instrument, posture your vocal tract, than, you know, trying to force the larynx lower, um, where you do tend to get that, you know, darker, but dull and falsified sound. Hopefully that helps. Hmm. Uh, let's see, James, so you're chatting. Joshua, hi. I don't know if I've seen you before either, so welcome. Exhaling through the nose when inhaling the breath. I used to have this resonance, now I don't have it anymore. Exhaling through the nose. So you're talking about like when you're singing, like, or do you talk about like nasal resonance in the sound? Um, are you looking? Is that I don't know if it's what you're talking about? If you're needing, if you're trying to get more nasal resonance, and in which case, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of nasality in the tone, um, but I think that there's something to be said, and there's some a lot of science to back it up that um, slightly lowering the soft palate through the passaggio, not to the point where we have really um, like audible nasalance, nasal resonance, um, can actually benefit us through that transition, the registration transition points. Um, but, you know, for for training purposes, I love like your hums and your NGs. The NGs in particular, I love going through the passaggio. And I know some people don't, some people are concerned about that because they're concerned that it can lead to nasality. I've never really found that to be the case um, with any students, so I don't really I don't share that concern. Let's see. Um, another question. Oh gosh, we're already at six o'clock. Okay. Um, I've read some articles about mixed voice. They said if you naturally have smaller vocal folds, it's better for you to sing with balanced or heady vo mixed voice because it's preventing you from getting fatigue when singing in the mid to upper belting range rather than using the chest dominant coordination. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think I think you probably know by now. Gosh, sorry guys. And I'm sure you guys have done this, but a week ago, I bit the front of my mouth, and then I bit it the next day, and then the third day I bit it yet again, and it was like dripping blood everywhere, so I'm so sorry, like drinking, talking, it keeps rubbing on my mouth, my teeth. So that's not helping. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah. So I'm sure you've heard that there are so many different opinions about what mixed voice is. For some, it's more of a heady coordination. For some, it's um, more of a chest coordination. Um, I think it depends on the, the context. If you're singing in musical theater, you may find that it tends to be more of a heady mixed voice. It's more in an M2. If you're singing in pop, you may find that it actually is a little bit more chesty in terms of the coordination. So I think it depends on what you're singing. Generally speaking, and I know some disagree with me on this, but generally speaking, I find that higher voiced individuals, so those may be those with, let's say, shorter vocal folds, um, they struggle more, yes, with um, being able to belt higher and bring up that chest weight. Generally speaking, I find that they tend to like to sit in head voice coordination M2 a little bit more. Um, so they tend to, yeah, fare better with the head mix as opposed to a chest mix. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's been my observation for the last 12 years or so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't really know how to answer that. I think that any voice can be trained to bring up more chest voice, but it's a really delicate kind of coordination in the sense that to get it to be healthy and to also get it to be artistic at the same time, it takes a lot of fine tuning um, to get it to that point. But yeah, I think it depends on what you're singing. I think 
there has been a lot of um, talk here on YouTube and the internet in general, you know, about mixed voice and it, you know, how it's, um, like in how in contemporary styles of music, we don't sing in head voice ever, we don't sing in M2, um, which is absolutely not true. You know, you can sit there and reverse engineer and, and analyze what um, really great singers are doing, and especially females, you will hear that they are actually singing in this kind of mix that sounds very speech-like, but definitely is sitting in that M2 coordination. So, yeah. It's been hard because it really messes with us psychologically, I think, um, especially higher voiced singers, because they feel like there's something wrong with them, or they feel like they just have to kind of give up their ideas of what they should be able to do vocally, um, based on, you know, voice type and what everybody's telling them that they're able to do, but there are some voices out there that are just, they figure it out, and I know some sopranos who are really good belters, and I know some, you know, mezzos who aren't. So, it, yeah, uh, it's such a it's such a unique thing. But I do know that I think a lot of singers are so affected by this idea of, oh, you've got to sing louder, and you've got to sing, you got a really powerful voice, and you have to be able to belt, and they start to lose sight of who they are individually, and they're striving to you know, um, make their voices bigger and louder and beltier and what have you. And, and I think it comes at a cost to them sometimes, um, emotionally too, psychologically, um, not so much physiologically per se, but there's definitely is, and artistically, I think sometimes because they, they're trying so desperately to make their voices sound like the next person or this person over here in terms of the loudness and powerful nature of it. And then they end up sacrificing, I think, some of what's uniquely them, and that's something I've had to learn as well in my own my own singing is to just turn my ears off when it comes to people giving their opinions about what contempt what singers of contemporary commercial music actually are doing on a physiological and acoustical level, and starting to listen to my intuition and starting to um, you know listen to when I record myself. It, does this sound like I want it to sound. Not does it sound like what somebody's telling me I should be doing, but is this ultimately the sound that I'm, I'm hoping to achieve? And even if it is something like I'm trying to get something that sounds like it's, um, you know, commercially viable, it, there are so many different sounds that are commercially viable. There are so many different singers out there that there isn't just one particular coordination. And if your voice just doesn't want to go there, like don't don't beat yourself up about that because it just it just breaks my heart because I struggled so long with this so hard about this but I just yeah learning to be able to just embrace our voices and yes grow them and yes extend our range and yes work on you know strengthening the voice but not to the point where we feel like we're somehow inferior or we're failing if we don't have what this next singer beside us has. <coughs> Let's see. That was really loud, sorry. Yep, we do this sing thing as a vocal warm for my choir. Oh yeah, the, the NG. I like that one. I you from getting cheek. Oh yeah, I already read that part. Hi Janet. You responding to Diana? or it's a matter of breath support or there's a limit to our voices naturally when it comes to voice uh, mixed voice or belting yes I think there is absolutely a limit um, <clears throat> a lot of research out there with um, has shown that if women for example we can really only raise the first formant to about D5 some say E5 for example and if belting is really locking into that yell resonance coupling of you know the the um, the first formant with the the second harmonic and kind of you know doing that then if that's belting if that's how we define it which there are so many different aesthetics for belting and so many different definitions but if that's how we define it and theoretically we're staying in chest voice that's about the point where it kind of stops but then you know there are different there's more of that mixed belt 
And, you know, if you listen to, you know, something like Defying Gravity, right, there's that F5 that's supposed to be in belt, but if you really listen to it, it's just, I think that the singer, the singers who are, who are singing that note aren't fully out in, like, in chest voice. They're not belting a full chest voice. I think they're in this mixed, mixed coordination, and I'm hearing, like, a, just, you know, compression. I'm just hearing probably the, the LCAs at the back of the vocal folds just bringing, I think that's where the compression's coming from, not so much the medial compression from the, the TAs. Um, it's my own theory, and what I feel myself when I'm singing up there. So I think that there is definitely a, an acoustical and a physiological limit, but that limit is going to differ from person to person. Okay, we're probably going to wrap up in a minute, guys. The I'm a baritone also sings in the mezzo range, so I'm singing. But yeah, generally Cockney, you're still comfortable up higher, aren't you? Um, Janet saying hi to James. Oh, yeah, you guys know each other. Beth. Oh, hi, Beth. I don't think I've seen you either before. <coughs> Excuse me. I have quite a nasally talking voice, and I struggle to get a clean sound, a nice clean sound, when I'm singing anything but classical music. It is quite squeezed and sounds like I have a cold. How do I open up? That's interesting. So with classical music, it sounds like you're able to elevate the soft palate, get it up and out of the way, close off the nasal port. Um, when I have singers who are struggling with nasality, so it says you have a cold. That sounds like it's denasalized. Hmm. Because if it sounds, if it's nasalized, it doesn't usually sound. If you think of, if you think of it right, when you have a cold, there's usually mucus and there's inflammation. And so you can't breathe out of your nose, right? So every time you try to say a nasal consonant or vowel, if you have a language, if you speak a language that has nasal vowels, <coughs> excuse me, the sound doesn't come through like it's supposed to. It just sounds stuffed, right? Stuffy. Um, so that's denasalized when it, there's supposed to be nasal resonance, but you're not actually getting it. And so that's what it's sounding like to me, actually. It's sounding like you're not, I don't know if you're, so used to getting that the nasal port closed and so used to getting the soft palate high that maybe when you're singing contemporary music that it's a struggle but so I was going to say usually with nasalized sounds I do like um, plosive sounds for example like the B's and P's because when you're doing the plosive sound you have to build up air pressure behind the closure this pressure in order to make that sound which means that you have to seal off the nasal port because you can't build up pressure if there's an opening right um, <clears throat> but this sounds like it's um, it's possibly denasal. I actually have um, I have a video on nasality and the denasal sound. I explain it more. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys, my allergies are getting really bad. I think I'm allergic to my dog. Not really. Dust. Maybe I should just do more cleaning. I don't know. All right. But he says it's, it's quite squeezed. It sounds like you have a cold. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that's what it is. So I would almost say just do sounds. Like um, one of the things I love working on is like nasal vowels with students. Like you, you can do like the NG that I talked about earlier, but even just doing like eh, oh, 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 and learning to be like, oh, oh, and it's supposed to be filtering partly up the nose and partly up the mouth. That resonance is going through both chambers. Um, you may find that that's fun. You might have to fiddle around with it though, because it may be a difficult sound for you to make. Um, but it's like, um, like eh, eh. When you're doing that, it's like you're really finding like eh, 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 eh. Learning to be able to kind of let it go into that ugly, almost like a witch's cackle space too. I find like it's it's twangy. Eh, 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 eh. eh. It's bright and it's it feels very sharp. Yeah, so I would maybe try stuff like that. I would actually encourage the nasality because I think you're actually talking about denasal. Um, let's see, C8, the great. See, did I get that right? <laughs> I, I have a feeling it, it, it reminds me like, you know, some sort of vanity license plate. I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering if I'm missing something. I feel like I'm not able to say, sustain a good support posture all the way through a phrase. I think I set it up correctly, but I feel that my neck muscles and larynx always want to get involved. Okay, yeah, so a few things could be happening there, and I don't know without actually hearing you um, or seeing you, but it could be that your neck and larynx muscles are getting involved because of postural issues, just um, alignment issues. 
so you you could find you know if you're if you're like so many of us your head could be too forward for example um you know and you just might not be aligning the cervical spine very well there could be something like that but um yeah let's see muscles or yeah you're either over supporting or under supporting um when the neck muscles those extrinsic muscles tend to get involved especially we tend to um it, it's oftentimes to try to compensate for things not being well connected here so when you say sustain a good support posture like what are what are you talking about are you talking about you know thrusting the abdominal wall out and in are you talking about trying to maintain expansion you try to do some sort of mix of the two of them because I think it really it's possible that you are not controlling the pressures effectively enough um, I with a lot of my students at V exercise that sustained and then you could do the V V V V V um, at some other point but even just that or Again, I feel like what that does is you're, you've got this really controlled opening. It's very consistent. And I feel like that back pressure encourages that nice engagement here, a very appropriate engagement. And I feel like it really balances things, things out a lot. So that in straw work, um, it, it may be that there, you're either over-supporting or under-supporting, so getting too much pressure or not enough. And then so, again, your throat muscles are trying to compensate. Um, Stratista, if I'm singing loudly or heavily very hard, like sometimes my chorus teacher is like, you need to be a little louder. And I'm I'm also comfortable with higher harmonies and lighter tones. Yeah, you know, and some of it is, it's hard because sometimes we are legitimately lighter voiced, you know, but if somebody's saying you need to be a little bit louder, there's a chance that, you know, you could be like I was for so many years and I still, I still want to go there a lot. Um, where you just you're you like the sound the lightness and you like how it feels and you like how safe it feels and how reliable it is I felt like you know with my lighter singing I definitely felt like I had a lot more control but then I wasn't necessarily making the sounds that I wanted to make all the time so I had to work toward building more strength and loudness into my sound just because those were my aesthetic goals and um, they're based on the songs that I want to sing, the music that I was, I'm hoping to sing. So, yeah, there's something to be said sometimes about finding our comfort spot, but sometimes, yeah, like, I, I'm always concerned when a choir director says, sing louder, sing louder, because if the person is not singing with good technique, when he or she is trying to increase the loudness, there's always that risk of things not feeling very good, not sounding good usually. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to get any louder, you've got to do it with correct technique. Sad not nesses? I don't know what that is. That's interesting. Okay, I have a question. The thing is, I found my mixed voice some time ago. Good. I can go up to C sharp 5 while I'm doing my warm ups, but when I sing a song, I can't go up to. I can't go up. Oh, I, I'm assuming you stop at G4? What would you suggest? So, I don't, again, I don't know. I'm going to just take an educated guess here. Ooh, wow, it's getting late, guys. All right, um, I'm going to take an educated guess that you, it's probably a combination of the vowels that you're using and the consonants and how they're interacting with each other. Um, very often, singers do really well with exercises, especially if they're just, just vowels. And um, then when they go to sing songs, everything just seems to fall apart. They can't find the same coordination. So one of the things that I do is I take like a training vowel. Like I use a a lot, like cat, the vowel in cat. And what I would do is I would substitute um, the, the lyrics, for example, with as, and I'd find that spot, and then I gradually start to reintroduce the other vowels and try to find that resonance space. Space, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, things are just dripping, guys. Um, yeah, I would try to find that same sort of resonance space of my a. Ah. If I find my a ah space, it's a really good mixed voice space for me. Like when I do musical theater in particular, I find a different space when I'm doing pop, but I sing a lot of musical theater and I, I've got to get into that bright a ah space for me. And then I just substitute that, like the lyrics for as ah for the lyrics, and then I gradually reintroduce some of the different speech sounds. Um, and you may find that that helps stripping it bare a little bit, just, just 
minimizing the number of sounds that you have in the particular phrase. You may find that that's really helpful. Um, temporarily substituting your vowels, your bad vowels for a good vowel, like for me again, as a really good mixy vowel for me. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry guys. Oh, wow, it's bad. All right, I might have to quit soon. <laughs> oh, triple, sorry, typo. Then, oh, 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 by the way, thank you very much for this live stream. Oh, you're most welcome. It has meant a lot to me. You get some knowledge and you're very clear and detailed. Oh, I'm glad you think I'm clear because I think I'm completely incoherent today. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for that. I've missed some of these, but today is kind of my lucky day. Yeah, it's an hour later today because my sons had um, Irish Step, an Irish Step competition today. And so my one son went in the morning, and then my other son was at 2.45, so there's no way I was going to make it back here. It's almost an hour away, or is an hour away with the walking to the parking lot. So I had to postpone it a little bit today or delay it. So self-taught, still 15. Oh, yeah, so you keep working at it. 15 still young with the voice, definitely. Hoping someday I can work with a vocal coach. I think that would be really helpful. Um, Honestly, if you could make, if you could swing it now, would be the time when you're starting out early. It's better off to actually have really good training right from the start, so that you don't have to go and undo things later on, which ultimately could be more costly in terms of both time and money. <laughs> Great. <coughs> Went down the wrong way. <coughs> This is fun. All right, um, Beth, you're welcome to talk to me. We also sing a beautiful little Spanish number. <coughs> That's good. So oh, sorry, guys. <coughs> oh, I'm just doing great today. Samuel, oh, hi, nice to see you, Samuel. I haven't seen you in a while. Guy, contemporary. How to connect the thinner coordination above A4 area with the thicker one below. Worst are phrases that peak few times at A4 if melody. I think it depends on what you're singing, how bright you want it. Um, I think generally speaking with most singers, most skilled singers, guys, um, <coughs> excuse me. Oh wow, it's really bad. It's getting worse and worse as the time goes on here. Sorry. <laughs> Um, around A4, I mean, if you're not in an acoustically closed voice, <laughs> sorry guys, um, that's probably where you're, you're going to really struggle because around there it's like so hard for guys to actually bring up a full chest voice. So yeah, you don't want it to suddenly thin there either, so that's where you need to kind of learn to be able to stabilize the vocal tract a little bit and be able to, I would even say stabilize your vowel. again. If you want to learn a little bit more about open and closed voice, I would check out, you know, my video with Ken Bozeman, the interview there. And I know I have some other videos on the topic too that I've touched upon. <coughs> Sorry. It goes higher, it feels okay to thin out, but when the highest note is A4, I want to keep the timbre, which leads to raising volume and fatiguing my voice after a few A4s. Yeah, there are definitely ways to um I think closed voice up there, for for guys in particular, but even for females, as we get a little higher, especially. Um, I think that's that's the key. Like when I work with my my students, <clears throat> sorry, my male students. Um, I know I'm like clearing my throat. Something you should never do. Being very careful though. <laughs> um, when they're when they're moving through that range and they they don't want the voice to suddenly go into falsetto or sound really weak and light they want the fullness they either have to get into shout but for a lot of guys especially baritones I mean a4 is about the as high as they can shout um, there's really the only alternative I feel is to go in, into that and we'll call it the Pavarotti coordination it's not just his he doesn't own it <laughs> um, but it's really kind of a classical setup where you're again allowing the vowels to turn over and I've worked with a lot of baritones who can sing these beautiful C5s that are very full voiced. Um, and even if they are in a head voice, 
it's not a wimpy falsetto. It's it's a full voice. And so I think any voice type can be trained to sing that way. And I think that's really the I think that's the solution to so much. And if you listen again to really good singers, you'll hear that they're actually not all singing with this open voice yell kind of coordination that when they get up into this G, A, B flat range, they're starting to acoustically close off the voice. Um, you know, I hear it in like Chris Daughtry, for example, does it on some of his A's and B's and, um, you know, other singers do it as well. So yeah, check out that video and hopefully it'll explain it. If you have questions, just ask me in that comment section. <coughs> Excuse me. You guys are under a lot of pressure to sing high. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Cornelius, are you, Cornelius, were you saying that you're going to have a singing lesson soon? Oh, okay. Well, have a good singing lesson. Sing counter tenor, sing classical. Very good. Polyphonic singing. Excellent. Um, I posted something on the SingWise Facebook page a little while ago um, with um, Adley Ballantyne, or Ballantyne, and he was just doing this really cool overtone singing, and he was giving some really practical instruction on how to do that, so I thought it was really cool, because I know some people are interested in it. Um, <coughs> oh, Cockney, you don't get all the M1 and M2 malarkey. <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, so M1 is like, you know, it's like mode one, which is really kind of your, we'll call it your chest voice for just to simplify it here. Um, M2 is kind of like your head voice, and then you've got M0, which is your um, vocal fry, where the, you know, the vocal folds are rattling, and they're very short and compact and rattling off of each other, um, usually vibrating aperiodically. And then you've got, you know, your M2 on top, uh, sorry, M3 on top of that, which is your, like, your whistle voice, where it has a, a, a very different um, set up of the vocal folds. So they really just indicate um, different kind of like mechanisms of or different vibratory patterns of the vocal folds. So that's really all they are. Um, I use it just because I know there are some people here who use that. Um, I'm still okay using chest voice and head voice because um, it's just I think if there's an understanding, if we understand each other, then I think we're okay. Because <clears throat> I don't think the M1, M2 thing completely solves the um, the confusion either resolves it. Hey, hi. Um, I'm a tenor and I had problems singing head voice higher than G5. I experienced strain. Even at, even though I try try to get tight on the neck muscles, is there hope for me to develop higher? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a true tenor, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you're not a true tenor, um, you know, baritones, you should be able to sing above G5 very comfortably. Um, so. Yeah, there's just something that you're doing, and it's, that's that kind of pivotal note for a lot of guys is around that G. Um, you're probably, again, resisting that acoustical turning over the voice. That's I find that's the most common thing is that you you just reach a certain point where you just can't keep, like, you can't keep going up in the same way over and over and over again, and just every single note is sung the same way. You have to do something differently at some point. I did not explain that well at all. <coughs> very distracting. So um, I think if you, I don't know how much, how long you've been listening, Jimmy, but some of the stuff I was talking about earlier, like, you know, just checking out that Ken Bozeman interview that I did, um, acoustically closing off the voice, learning to stabilize the vocal tract a little bit as you get there, um, and really connecting really well with the breath. That V exercise, um, I feel, is just one of the best exercises for, for helping to develop that, um, that whole coordination from the resonance to the vocal fold, set up vibration to the breath. Um, I'm gonna wrap up, guys. I know there's lots. Of, there are lots of questions still, but well, Cockney. I think when you're singing, <coughs> excuse me, what little bit I've heard you sing before, when you're singing in that higher range, you're in an M2. It's just a lighter mechanism. It's the TAs are. Um, you know, like they're not as involved, the, the chest voice muscles are not as involved, um, that sort of thing. M1 is the heavy mechanism, yet where the vibratory mass is higher and the body cover ratio is above zero. Yep. Yeah, so um, so generally speaking, the um, we call the closed quotient, how long the vocal folds are touching each other for each vibration, is usually longer in the lower range in that M1 range. M2 is lighter mechanism used by countertenors, female classical singers, head voice, and includes falsetto. 
Yeah, um, I think, I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's just counter tenors. Um, definitely, I think any male could use it. Um, and not, I mean, even head voice, not even just falsetto. Um, anyway. <coughs> do, 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 do. Cockney, I think everybody's saying. Bye. All right. D nasal is what I was describing. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, nasal sounds. Like, just go crazy with them. NGs, Ms, um, you know, you've got your Ns. You can do two. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't use them as much. I use them preceding vowels. And then I would work on those. I actually have a video, too, on um, showing an exercise that or something I was doing with one of my students. when She was 12 at the time um, on uh, nasal vowels. Check that out after this. Um, just look up, I think, if you just look up sing wise and then do um, nasal vowels, I think you, I think it might help. Um, and I was showing how she was struggling, struggling through, because she's going, she was going through her own voice change basically as 12, she's 13 now, um, trying to work through that break where she's used to being able to drag up a lot of weight. She's a belter naturally and um, really struggling with that break in a song. And so we applied the this concept to the song. And I show you how I, practically take a training sound and bring that into um, like a song situation. So uh, you're welcome, Cockney. Comfy to sing my yeah. RM. When I am doing a descending slider exercise, I find that my voice either collapses at a certain point or sounds like a foghorn. This only happens a few note uh, uh, a few certain notes. Way to fix this. Um, so you're saying descending, just sliding down. Yeah, so I don't know what you mean by collapses. It just gets weak, or does it just kind of, does it flip? What does it do? When you say it sounds like a foghorn, that says to me that you're lowering your larynx and you're trying to reach for the note. Because um, I describe it as a foghorn, too, and when people, singers try to sing like this, to reach for the low notes. Um, so in that case, I always, just, I always add twang into it, so go with the really bright vowels bringing the brightness that you have above down with you instead of reaching down for the notes. I even sometimes think up so I'm not I'm not overshooting that note and I'm not over darkening it. I almost think up up with that note even though I'm going down. Sometimes that helps too. Let's see. Hope you get well soon. Thank you. I'm not really I'm not sick. It's just my stupid allergies and I have it they're year round and I, I was on allergy medication for like six years. Um, just antihistamines every single day for like six years and I'm like this is crazy like first of all I'm not even a medication person I don't even have Tylenol in my medicine cabinet um, but uh, so I went to my allergist and I just said listen like this is because it was what it was doing was I still had post nasal drip all the time because um, I'm allergic to dust mites and mold that's all I'm allergic to not even, it's not even a seasonal thing for me not trees not grasses um, so yeah, and I just, you know, I said, hey, it's really thick and like it's hard to swallow and I'm just, it's constantly dripping, but now it's just thick because of the antihistamines because they have that drying effect. And so she tried, we've tried, I've been trying a couple other things and I haven't really noticed a significant difference. I'm like, I'm just off it now. I'm not sneezing. My eyes aren't itchy or watery anymore. And it's like, okay, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. Um, trying to figure that out anyway, but thank you so much. Um, wow, guys, this has been a, a long live stream, but it's been really good hanging out with you. Um, I will see you in a month, and um, oh, yeah, I won't, won't see you guys until after the holidays, so happy holidays, Merry Christmas if you celebrate Christmas, happy Hanukkah, all that good stuff, um, happy new year, and um, hopefully a video or two will come out as the month goes on. I make no promises at this point, though. <laughs> um, thank you, Cockney. Bye, James. All right, now she just figure out how to turn this off again. All right, have a really great um, holiday season, guys. Bye.